Here we are again, folks. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Sylvester Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you for joining us. And also thank you for supporting this podcast and sharing it with others. Uh, the feedback has been great. You guys are great. And thanks for believing in me. I need to thank our sponsor, Veracity Networks, and my good friend, Drew Peterson, as well. Thank you for believing in me. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to be in the position we are now. We're, we're touching a lot of ears right now, and it's, it's wonderful. And, and I have to give credit to my guests. My guests have been fantastic. And today is no different. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I have Dave Brisbane this morning, and we're here bright and early. And Dave, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's so great to be here, Todd. Thanks for having me. Oh, you betcha. Um, Dave and I have a mutual friend, Aaron, who uh, is an amazing person as well. And he is, uh, I think, Dave's biggest fan. We were just talking about that. And I get quotes from Dave every single day because of Aaron. And, and it's been very inspiring. And I can't wait for the listeners to hear your story, Dave. And just a little background on Dave. Um, he is a pastor, teacher, a licensed pastoral counselor, and a spiritual director with a BA in English Lit, writing, and a master's in divinity. He's a published writer. You've, you're an author of two books. Um, Dave has dedicated two decades to teaching the process of returning to ancient Eastern spirituality with a framework on modern Christianity. And I want to get to to understand that a little bit more. His practice of uh, um, spirituality and work in drug and alcohol treatment and counseling coupled with his business and communications and experience has connected Dave to the difficult issues facing individuals, families, and corporate personnel while giving him a passion to help others in the areas of counseling, coaching, speaking, and spiritual direction. And um, like, like I just mentioned, he's written a few books. He owns a treatment center who, where he's helping addicts recover. Uh, he's a man of God and a great faith, and he's a very inspiring person. And so I'm so excited for our listeners to hear your amazing story, Dave. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. <laughs> After and then, an intro like that, I think I have no place to go but down. So let me see what I can do here. <laughs> right. Well, why don't, you, uh, why, don't, why don't we start, Dave? Tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? And give us some, an idea of what your family life was like as a child. Well, um, grew up in the L.A. area. And uh, my, my, I'm adopted. So uh, I've, I've got that going for me. Okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> at least I knew my parents really wanted me because they had to, they had to fight for that. And, right. Sure. Um, grew up in a, in a Catholic family. So I had a, a, a Mexican Filipino mother and a Scotch Irish father. Oh, and wow. he, he converted to Catholicism uh, in order to be able to marry my mother back in the, in the forties. Uh, okay. that's, that's what you did back then. And, right. Um, so I was raised Catholic and uh, we were at, we were at church every single day. And, I have those the fond memories of, of every morning, getting up, getting dressed, going to mass, and then going to Paris restaurant. I remember Paris restaurant for pancakes. And oh. it, it, was, it was just, it was a ritual. And uh, sure. But it, it was a, it was a good middle-class upbringing and uh, just, just kind of typical, I think for, for the fifties back then. Right. And did you have siblings? I have one sister who's also adopted and no relation to me, blood relation. Okay. Fact, it's kind of interesting growing up with uh, no blood relations. The only blood relations I know of are my three children. And so it kind of changes things, you know, to, right. to, uh, to not have blood as the major tie in your family. And uh, I, I, I don't know, to me, it's kind of, it's kind of healthy. Sure. Sure. The people that choose to be with you, that's your family. Right. I know you're also very passionate about music, right? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, do you play an instrument? Yes, yeah. I started. I started playing clarinet in the fifth grade, <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't know what you do with clarinet. It, when I hit high school, uh, the guy behind me in uh, in biology, I remember, was always pounded on my back. And finally, I turned around and said, "What are you, a drummer?" And he goes, "Yeah." And so we decided to start a band together. And so there he was with his drum set, and there I was with my clarinet. And it's like, what do you do with that? Yeah, and really. I, I'm I'm interested. <laughs> Well, uh, I switched to saxophone and flute, and then we uh, <laughs> recruited a guitarist, and then I realized that saxophone and flute wasn't really going to cut it either, so I started playing guitar, and then uh, eventually, as I was playing sax, you got to play your doubles in order to be useful in a band, so I learned to play guitar and keyboard as, um, as backup instruments, and so um, we started playing as a dance band back then, um, and I've been playing music ever since. 
um, out of uh, high school. Um, well, so this will be getting ahead of the story, but I joined a monastic order out of high school. But when I left that order and okay. came back, uh, I, I was playing music all through my 20s, writing songs. And I guess uh, at some point, my, my claim to fame is that I do have an album on a Grammy. No I do have a song on a Grammy nominated album. Really? Uh, that was... Uh, that was the height of my songwriting accomplishment. <laughs> hey, but, that's, that's a lot more than a lot of people can say. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> During my 20s, that was my goal, was, was to, be a, to be a songwriter and to continue in music production. But uh, that rapidly changed. Wow, that's awesome. Well, I know, you know you're very passionate about following and worshiping God, and, and you're, you're, you're a man of faith. How did, was that cultivated as a young child? I mean, how did, how did you get so passionate about this? And it's almost obviously it's your mission in life to, to, to do that. So why don't you tell us how that kind of came about? Well, I was raised in, like I said, in the Catholic faith and uh, altar boy, 12 years of Catholic education, uh, you know, primary school and secondary school. And I, I don't know what, it's just, I can remember from the earl earliest, my earliest memories uh, being taught by the nuns and lying in bed at night and trying to figure out how things could be so. You know, the things that I was taught in, in the religion classes, things I was taught about God, just trying to understand. And I remember the mind just going uh, as I was trying to get to sleep at night. Right. All, always something that was in, in, my, in my head. Uh, going through high school, it, it wasn't so much that uh, spirituality was a driving force in high school. I, I was a uh, typical kid doing what, what kids do. Right. But there were two brothers that, um, brothers, they were monks that taught me. And I think they were basically only probably five or six years older than I was in high school. This is one of them. It was their first assignment out of the, out of their formation. And the other one uh, was just maybe a couple of years older, but they were both in their twenties themselves. And they took me on under their wing kind of as big brothers would. And I remember at the time, I didn't have a real close relationship with my, my parents. It, it wasn't that kind of relationship where I could talk to them about everything. And the, the monks filled that gap for me. Okay. I remember that I could actually go, and I did several times late at night, since the, uh, the brothers lived on campus in, the, in their own house, I could throw rocks at the, uh, at the window of Brother Kowaleski. I called him <laughs> Ski, Brother Ski, and, and wake him up you know, in the middle of the night and he'd come down and we'd sit in the, in the front room and, and talk about whatever it is was on my mind and what was distressing me. And I remember one time uh, I was being a complete depressoid and very fatalistic, I guess. And, and he actually jumped up out of the chair and, and kind of got me into a half Nelson and said, <laughs> he was, in, until I lightened up, you know, he was, he was going to kick my butt. Uh, but that was the kind of relationship that I had with them. That, right. that it was real, I could talk to them, and they got me through a very difficult time uh, in my life. And when I, by the time I graduated high school, I realized now a lot of it was just a confusion of what I was going to do next. But I wanted to be able to do for other young men what they did for me. Wow. And give that back. And so I joined the order. And so out of high school, uh, after one last summer on the beach here in, in Southern California, I got on a plane to Illinois, and the House of Formation was in Lockport, which is about 60 miles southwest of the Loop in Chicago, out in the middle of the cornfields. I mean, nothing could have been more foreign to me. I grew up my entire life in the city, you know, east of East LA, and to suddenly be in this rural area in the middle of corn was <laughs> so different. Culture shock. Culture shock, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember the, the, the first morning after being up most of the night saying goodbye to my friends uh, in, the, in the monastery, showing up to chapel in a, was a baseball jersey, jeans in the 70s, which were covered with rac macrame and uh, patches and bare feet and walking, stumbling kind of down the aisle to get my seat, met by the novice master who just turned me right around and said, okay, this isn't the way this works. <laughs> So it was, it was complete culture shock. But I, I realized early on that I didn't really have a vocation, that religious life was something completely other than I thought it was going to be. And what I really had wanted to do was to teach and, and to help young men. So I left the order and at that point kind of left the Catholic Church at the same time, not because I so much meant to, as because my life was taking a different turn into my early 20s. And 
I, I just had other concerns, music being primary. And so I kind of took another course for the next 15 years. Wow. So if you don't mind, you, you mentioned, you know, you were going through a really difficult time. Can you describe that in a little more detail for us? Like, you know, you mentioned that there was, you know, something that was going on and these guys obviously helped you. Can do you, can you help us out with that? What, what was going on there? You know, I, I don't, there wasn't anything specific, you know, there okay. wasn't so much anything that was, you know, there was no trauma or abuse or anything in my life at that time, but I felt a, 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 a very acute alienation, just a dissociation that I didn't fit. I didn't belong. Mm. Um, it was now looking back on it and knowing what I know now because of, um, our kids, I uh, realized that I'm, I'm probably on the, uh, the Asperger's scale. And I guess Asperger's really isn't talked about so much more. So it's just the, the front end of the autism scale. But right. as we started researching that and looking at our sons. Uh, I realized I had all the markers myself because I wasn't able to really process social cues. I remember as a kid, I always felt that I didn't fit in and there was always that thing that kind of separated me. I always felt on the outside looking in and um, that disconnection was uh, something that I couldn't shake, but yeah. the brothers helped me to, to connect and to feel part of. And I realized joining the order was to try to continue that feeling a part of that yeah. there was a tribe that I belonged to that I just couldn't seem to find. Even though I had friends and, and, and I connected in social ways, uh, I just always felt outside. And uh, that, that was uh, excruciating after a certain amount of time. For sure. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of people can relate with that. I think, especially when we're younger, we, we all want to fit in, we want to be accepted. And, you know, I say this a lot with my clients, you know, c connections, the opposite of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so being connected is really important and it's, it's, it's crucial. And I think obviously connection to a higher power and connection in that realm is very important. Obviously it's very important to you as well. You mentioned too, that, uh, as you, as you moved forward and, you know, you moved into the cornfield and stuff, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you had this desire to help, help young men kind of find their way as well. Talk about that. No, oh, it was just, I, I, want, I didn't realize what was going on at the time, that that disconnection was ultimately going to be spiritual. Now, I didn't know that. I, I just knew that I wanted to be a part of something, I suppose, larger than myself. And I didn't really have any way of, of expressing that either. Uh, I, just, I just felt the pain of it all. Uh, but I wanted to help. I wanted to be part of, I, I guess, you know, sort of a social food chain, if I can call it that. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, you know, people had helped me. I wanted to help. And I just wanted to feel a part of all of that. Ultimately, all of that is spiritual. And I wasn't thinking of it that way. But that was what was driving me forward and continued to drive me forward um, through my 20s. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I feel like now when I look back at my 20s, I was sleepwalking through my 20s. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you can look back on your life, Todd, and, and just there are, swatches of my life that I don't really have any clear memories of. I mean, I can reconstruct what I did, yeah. but it's almost like I was reading it out of a book or someone told me what happened because I really wasn't present. I really wasn't there. I was just going from, from, from thing to thing more in a reactive mode than in a proactive mode. And at the end of my 20s, I got married and had a child and then the marriage broke up three years later. Mm. And that was the moment in my early 30s where everything came crashing down. And I can look back. I remember the, the first AA meeting that I went to that I was uh, invited to. I remember old timer standing up and saying <laughs> that he was grateful to be an alcoholic. And, you know, my jaw kind of hit my chest. And I said, what in the world is he talking about? You know, how in the world can you be grateful for something as horrible and, and you know, life-threatening yeah. alcoholism? And I totally get it uh, now. And I understood what he was saying when he said it. But his alcoholism was the, the pivotal point in his life. It was the pain and the trauma sure. great enough that right. finally moved him to do something different. It became what I like to call a hinge moment where the trajectory of his life changed in a completely you know, different path. My divorce was that hinge moment in my okay. life. As a, as a Catholic, and I still identified as a Catholic, of course, 
um, you know, Catholics don't get divorced and divorce is looked at as, as something that unless sanctioned and annulled by the church, you can no longer continue in good faith in the church. And so to be divorced, something I never thought that I would do, to now have a three-year-old daughter who had to shuffle between mother and father, um, these were things that, that I just couldn't reconcile with myself. I didn't recognize myself or know who I was. And that was the beginning. That was the hinge moment where I had to find a new trajectory for life because I right. couldn't really come up with a reason to keep breathing at that point. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's really um, intense. You know, you talked about connection, connecting spiritually was the, your, that's what was missing in your life. What does that look like for people? I mean, what does that look like for you to connect spiritually? I know that's kind of a big question. It's a, it's a huge question. <laughs> it's, you know, it's interesting, Todd, right now with, with COVID, um, because yeah. you know, the, the, this, this COVID is a worldwide crisis that is forcing many of us to take a look at what that spiritual connection really means. Uh, we devise so many ways to paper over the lack of that deeper connection. Uh, I had done it you know, throughout my 20s and with marriage and with all of these things and work and music, uh, avoiding the deeper questions in life. But my life conspired in such a way, and life does this, of course, at, at intervals that will keep getting progressively more um, acute and traumatic if we continue to not answer the call to, to this deeper connection. But um, life has kind of conspired in such a way collectively right now. COVID has stripped right. away many of the things that we use, uh, the institutions we use, the activities that we use to paper over a, a deeper lack of connection. And so the, the work, the entertainment, the sports, the, the social activities that, that we use to try to uh, create an illusion of meaning and purpose and even identity, who the heck we are, right. um, have collectively been stripped away. And so uh, with a lot of the counseling that I'm doing, uh, I'm finding that the cracks in the foundation, the lack of connection that we have at root is now just coming to the surface in, in such a, you know, a palpable way that yeah. we're forced to deal with it. Now, whether they actually deal with it in terms of working toward deeper connection or not is the open question. Sure. Um, we're forced to deal with it in terms of the trauma that it's causing, in terms of the breakdown of, of even family and marriage relationships that it's causing, so on and so forth. But that's what happened with me. I had just tried to outrun the, um, the lack of connection, the, the angst that I was feeling, the, the feeling of always being on the, out, being on the outside looking in um, for 15 years or so. And that all came crashing down. And I knew that I needed to find something that felt true, something that had meaning and purpose. And so my goal for the next four or five years and my method was just to basically say yes to everything and just try to find something that made sense. And so I went on a kind of a whirlwind tour for, for, uh, for truth. And again, it wasn't so much that I was thinking of it this way. This is in retrospect. Yeah. I just was trying to find something. And I looked in every direction I, I possibly could, except Christianity, because I figured I'd already been there and done that. And so that really wasn't where I was looking. I was looking for something different. And uh, that search took me to you know, Eastern philosophy, Eastern religions, comparative religions. It took me into paranormal kind of focus. I remember I took a self-development workshop, which was basically palm reading and uh, clairvoyance <laughs> and remote uh -huh. healing and channeling. and all that sort of thing. Um, let's see, there was pyramidology, there was uh, religious science, theosophy. I spent a year in the Mormon church. I met someone who was just oh, a, an amazing person and as she was describing her church and how her church helped her mm -hmm. through a difficult time in her life. Um, and I was just enamored with the, uh, with the community and the connection, which is what I crave so much. But right. I still couldn't get my head around the theology you know, that my Catholicism was still ringing in my ears. <laughs> right. And then someone finally invited me. Um, by this time, I was working in marketing communications, and uh, I had a staff of about 16. And one of my staff members, members invited me to her church. And um, sure, well, I'll go. And it was, it was Christian, and, but it was evangelical, and it was so vastly different, a converted warehouse with a full band on stage, things I had never <laughs> experienced before in right. a church setting. But of course, there was music, and there was a community, and I, I was in. 
And it felt like coming home to, to Jesus, but in a way that was completely altered. But I, I just was trying everything I could to find something that made sense. And that was that search for meaning, that search for spiritual connection. Even though I was looking for it, I still didn't really understand what it was until later. Okay. Wow. Very well said. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I want to ask you, I know you're, you're really big on being present in life. And I know that's one of your messages that you like to share. Can you, can you tell us what that looks like and what that means as well? I know you talk a lot about that and, and why is that so important for us to be present? Maybe the best way to answer that is to, to, to finish the story here. When I landed in the evangelical church, uh, I just wanted to be a part of something. I think that was my major focus. Right. And to feel like I was part of a group and a community. And the community really did. They embraced me. They brought me in. And, um, and then, of course, I became part of the, the uh, music team with, within weeks. And sure. I really entered into leadership and entered into um, you know, places of responsibility too soon. I was repeating the pattern that I always had, which was just to outrun the difficulties and right. kind of become part of everything. Um, and as soon as I did that, the, how would I put this? The doctrinal and the theological beliefs and practices of this very conservative evangelical church started to present themselves to me in a way that I realized there was still this, this missing piece, this huge missing piece. I couldn't reconcile the uh, theology as I had trouble reconciling it with the Catholic Church. But I, I just kept putting aside and papering over because I was enjoying so much being on the inside looking out for a change. Um, I met my uh, current wife at that period, okay. and um, we started dating, and I dragged her to the church. She was a, an ex-Catholic <laughs> as well, and, and she was intrigued, but also, you know, just kind of culturally mind-blown by what was going on because she had an experienced evangelical <laughs> yeah. church. But as we got to the point that we were um, ready to get married, uh, we went to our pastor and asked if he would do the service for us, and he said, no, he didn't think that he could, and, you know, we were shocked, and well, why not? And he said, well, we don't know that you have a biblical reason for your divorces because she was divorced as well. Okay. And, um, if that's the case, then we can't marry you. And then reading the scriptures very specifically as they did, um, would, would our uh, remarriage be biblical or would it be tantamount to adultery and so on and so forth? So reading very specific scriptural pattern passages, they had a very specific idea about Christian divorce and remarriage, which of course threw both of us into uh, the tailspin. Right. Yeah. I typically, for me, Mr. Intellectual, I went into study mode and I started studying everything I could about Christian uh, divorce and remarriage. And it was finally then that the light went on in my head and realized that biblical interpretation is basically an opinion. Right. I thought that it was always this monolithic truth from God. It was right or wrong. It was black, white, binary. And mm -hmm. I realized, no, there was even one book that had four different viewpoints from four different scholars reading the same biblical passages and coming <laughs> to four different conclusions right. about biblical divorce and remarriage. And so I realized I've got to do this on my own. I can't abdicate this to anybody else, this study. Right. But this time I was already in pastoral training. And so I made it my job to study Christian origins. And I figured the truth would be most apparent from the beginning of something. And right. so I studied Christian origins as my focus of study. And that led me to the Hebrew roots of Christianity, which I had never um, even heard of before. Uh, I somehow understood Jesus was a Jew, but that meant nothing to me until I started actually studying it, which led me to a study of the original languages, which finally led me to um, a Hebrew Jesus that I realized I could follow for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. It was at that point that I realized that if this really is Christianity, everything had come to a head then I'm not really a Christian. And if this is Jesus teaching, then I'm not a follower of Jesus. And I had to come to the point that I was completely ready to leave Jesus before I could actually find him. I had to let go of everything I thought I knew about Jesus in order to be able to finally see him. And in those pages of study is where I finally met him. But there was this critical missing piece. And this is what goes to, to your question about presence. Okay. I was looking for something that 
would make bring it all together and i spent a lot of time at a christian retreat house that i found in malibu it was sarah retreat which was run by the franciscans i befriended two of the of the priests there one franciscan and a diocesan and i also went and sought out the american catholic church which is a church that was in schism with rome and um found that priest there and i remember just getting an appointment with him I, I was tenacious at this time in my life. <laughs> it so sounds I like got it. an appointment with him, you know, and I sat down and he didn't know me from Adam. I still remember his name, Father Erskine. And uh, one and only time I met him, but uh, I, I just was throwing up all over his coffee table and telling him all this. And finally he says, how much time you got? And I said, I got time. He says, you want to take a ride? Sure. So he drove me to a, a Catholic bookshop book called Paula's Press, a few cities over, and just started pointing at book covers. And everything he pointed out, I bought. Walked out of there in the early 90s with about 100 and something worth of books, which back then was a lot of dough, you know? Yeah, wow. But he introduced me to authors like Thomas Merton and Brennan Manning and, and Henry Now, And of course, there was Augustine in there. And there was, there was so much richness. All of it was pointing me, along with the fathers and the, and the, the priests at Sarah, uh, were pointing me toward a contemplative spirituality, and especially Merton. Merton is, is the... Uh, the spiritual master that our country has produced that is responsible for bringing contemplative uh, spirituality back into the mainstream, you know, back in the 40s and the 50s and 60s. Um, but the introduction to me of contemplative spirituality married with a Hebrew Jesus, who once I looked at him again through a, a contemplative lens, realized Jesus was a contemplative as well mm. and a mystic as well. Okay. And if you're not familiar with those two terms, Basically, what they're talking about is a non-intellectual approach to our spirituality, an experiential approach to our spirituality. We in the West, and especially since the Reformation in the last 500 years, have taken our spirituality into the modern mode, which is rational and it is intellectual, and trying to understand God through our theology and our thoughts about God, which always puts us at a distance from Him. Right, right? sure. Object, right? What contemplative spirituality is trying to do is to step aside from the intellectual and move into a complete presence with God, where we are just connected, spirit to spirit, being to being. If you think about it, God's native language is silence. If we are going to communicate with God with no loss in translation, it is going to be in silence. That voice that talks to us in our head through which we think and categorize and, categorize and distinguish we think that's who we are, but it's not. That's a, a construct and a byproduct of our self-awareness and, 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 and consciousness. Uh, and to step aside from that in actual practice, whether it's meditative practice or a Christian um, you know, practice called centering prayer, which was developed in the 70s out of the ancient prayer of the heart of, of the early Christians, is that technique, that way of developing a way to step aside from our thoughts so that we can just be completely present yeah. and completely aware in the now. And then we can take that and make it a part of our daily activities so that awareness characterizes who we are. Love is not possible without awareness first. We have to be completely aware and present to the person we're with in order to be able to do what love requires. Because if we're approaching love more from a legal aspect, just following law, following right. rules, there, there's no love there. And there's right. no, there doesn't need to be any presence there. And so the point is presence. Awareness and presence, I'm convinced now, is 90% of the spiritual journey. Wow. If we can get to that, then everything else can flow from that. But if we don't have that as a core, then there's really no way that we proceed much further. And story after story in the New Testament, and Jesus teaching, you know, uh, just attests to that. Wow, very well said. It reminds me um, of the scripture as you were talking, Psalms 4610 that says, be still and know that I am God. And when you cross, cross reference still in the footnote, it says silence. Mm -hmm. And again, that's that connection piece, right? When we're present, we feel connected. And uh, that, that's, a, I love the way you described that. It was very well said, that's, that's powerful. So how... Well, that, well, that, that's it. Just, just to, to put a little, you know, knot on the end of that yeah. thought there. Uh, it's the, the tools of the contemplative are silence and solitude. 
you know, we use those as tools. Now that doesn't have to physically mean uh, physical silence and solitude. It, it's ultimately an interior silence and solitude. But to start with physical silence and solitude is, is always a prerequisite so that we can develop an interior silence and solitude, which then is going to become a stillness inside. And that, that stillness that the, the proverb talks about is a product of spending enough time in physical silence and solitude using certain techniques to help us to be able to step aside from thoughts that develops an interior silence and solitude and a stillness that we can then carry around with us the way an astronaut carries around his or her atmosphere inside the pressure suit. We can go anywhere now and, and keep our atmosphere with us and we can take that throughout our day. And that stillness is the way that we now relate to everyone and everything in, in our circle of, of, of awareness. And so that's the key. If, if we can do that, now we can relate to people in real love because we really see them and we can, we can present what love requires at any given moment. Wow, beautifully said. If there's someone listening right now, Dave, and they're, they're at the, they, they have no idea how to do this, to connect spiritually and be present and all that, what are some things they could do you know, and, you know, maybe explain like someone who has no idea, what would you tell them if they wanted to start connecting and, and being present? What could they do to, to make that possible? It is a matter of, of starting your own practice. And there are five things that everybody needs, uh, every human being needs in order to have a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And the people that come to me in counseling that are in distress or in, in maybe in some form of, of, of trauma even, um, the first thing I'm gonna wanna do is ask them about their day. What does their daily routine look like? What is their weekly routine like? Because what I'm trying to ascertain is how those five things are, are present or not present in their life. Okay. The five things are community, accountability, structure, discipline, and service. We all need those things. And really it's community structure and service. Those things need to be in place. But community is a little bit tricky because we can be part of a group. We can be part of a family, a work group, a church, and not really be present to it. To be present to a group is to be showing up and letting people see who you are deeply enough, becoming a part of the group enough so that you're actually missed if you don't show up and people will call you. Yeah. You actually become accountable to that group. It's kind of like in, in the 12 steps, I'm sure you've talked about, the key is not just to go to a meeting and check off a box because you did it. It's to go early, talk to people, get phone numbers, stay late, talk to people, yeah. get phone numbers. It's, in, it's becoming accountable to the people that are there and allowing them into your life and see you enough and vice versa that you now have true relationship. So being accountable to community is kind of community on steroids. And so those two kind of work as a group structure, okay. to actually have structure and be part of groups in such a way that they impose a structure on you that you are disciplined to, you know, obviously work does that because we're getting paid. But when you're a member of a church and you're actually attending those weekly services and you make that a priority and you show up to it, it's the showing upness uh, to the structure that is the key that you're really disciplined to it. Okay. But beyond the structure that is imposed on you from the outside in, there also needs to be a structure that you impose on yourself from the inside out. What do you do when nobody else is looking? What do you do, you know, in, in yeah. your own moments? And so for, to answer your question specifically about the person who wants to, to dive into contemplative spirituality is to set up your own practice. You know, wh whatever that looks like, it could be just something as simple as 20 or 30 minutes of quiet time in the morning. You're and right. then how you use that quiet time is, is going to, to be important. But it really can be anything that allows you to start practicing the technique of developing that inner stillness. Um, there is so much uh, talk about mindfulness right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, mindfulness and now that's become you know, a buzzword. And it's almost to the point that it becomes a meme and it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Yeah. But it, it's, it's obviously true that you're only going to um, be able to really find God if you're looking for God or that power that's greater than yourself 
at the intersection of here and now. You know, I like to think of yeah. it as a road sign. It's here and now, <laughs> yeah. as human beings, the only place we can be, because it can only be one place at one time, is here and now. So yeah. the only place we're going to meet God and, and ultimately our own meaning and purpose and sense of identity is here and now. And so we need to practice being here and now. Most of us spend at least half our time in, in actual fact, probably 80 to 90% of our time, and studies have shown this, not thinking about the thing that we're actually doing. Wow. Most of, our, most of our waking life, we are thinking about something other than what we're doing at the time, the conversation we're having, the task at hand. And furthermore, about 80 or 90% of the thoughts and, and the emotions that we're feeling as our mind is wandering off what we're actually doing is negative because that's what we continue to process, or the negative yeah. things. We don't right. dwell on the positive things, we dwell on the negative things, the things that are not done, the things that are, are dogging us. And so we are experiencing uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of negativity and angst that the moment does not contain. The moment is just fine. Right. To practice being present with these techniques, whether it's meditation, centering prayer, or just sitting with a cup of coffee and just watching the light change in the early morning yeah. and being present to what is there. And every time you realize that your thoughts have taken you off and you're no longer thinking about what you're doing, but you're thinking about all the endless lists of things that, that circle your brain, you just bring yourself back. Meditation, whether it, it's, it's an Eastern practice or whether centering prayer, they have techniques for bringing you back to the moment. You practice those things. Contemplative journaling can be another way to accomplish the okay. same. There can be uh, meditative walks. There's all different techniques. There's, there's dozens of them. And they're all designed to do the same thing, is to get, help us get really good at being able to be right here and right now. And only the only thought in our head is the one that pertains to the task at hand. And when we can get good at doing that offline, I call it offline, in these carved right. out times, then we can bring them online in mindfulness throughout the day. So that every time we're triggered with a negative emotion that typically um, triggers us to do a certain predictable behavior, whether it's lashing out if we're angry, whether it's isolating if we're depressed, we can build the awareness where we can stop, take a breath, realize what's happening, and then act accordingly to what the moment really requires, to what love really requires, which is usually the exact opposite of whatever we're being triggered to do negatively. <laughs> right, yeah. If we're triggered to isolate, then we engage. If we're triggered to lash out, we continue to act with kindness. And we develop a new default position. We're literally rewiring our brains as we go and learning to live in love, learning to live in connection. And then that takes us to the fifth, which is service. We have a way to actually give back. And it's in service, it's in connection with each other that we really find, and the only place we find, true meaning and purpose and identity as a human being. Because our identity will never be found in isolation. Right. Our identity is only and found in connection with each other and ultimately with God's spirit, which is experienced in each other in this life. Uh, God remains unseen. But uh, as we love each other, we are still loving God. And so for the, for the person who wants to jump in, that's the, the pattern uh, to, to effectively do it. Obviously, there are, there are books that you, that you can read. We've got a lot of material on our website. But it's always good to have somebody that is alongside you who's at least a few steps ahead of you. Because right. I'll tell you what, for me, there, I had a million questions when I started trying to practice contemplative spirituality myself. And thank God I had those priests that I could go to and a retreat center that I could go to and, and uh, just book time with the, the priests and talk to them. It, it's kind of ironic to me that I was, <laughs> I was training for leadership in an evangelical church, but everyone who was really mentoring me was still Catholic. Uh, <laughs> but it's because Catholics are the one branch of, well, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox are the branches of Christianity that have maintained the contemplative and mystical thread throughout 2000 years okay. of church history, whereas the Protestant church has largely moved into a more uh, intellectual bent. But, um, but that would be the process. And, okay. and, and you, know, you can do this just by reading and, and moving through this, um, but it, it is a little more difficult and there may be a little more pitfalls along the way. Um, 
I was largely doing this on my own with trips to, to meet people and talk to them. But the people that were in my immediate circle, of course, were not in this, in this mode. So I think it slowed me down a bit, not sure. having someone to walk with. Sure. Wow. Again, very well said. What, will you just list the five things again real quick? Community. Okay. Accountability. Structure. Discipline. And service. Oh, very well said. It's essential. Yeah, service is, I, I mean, I agree with the service. I mean, I agree with all of it. The service piece, you know, I heard it once said, Dave, that uh, if you master the first 11 steps of AA, you'll drink again. If you master step 12, you'll never touch another drop. You Amen know? to that. It's, yeah, it's that just giving back and helping someone else. There's no greater drug uh, of, or that feeling of a, a drug that could give you that when you help someone, that feeling of, just euphoria when we're making a difference in someone's life. And I think that's really your life, Dave, is just everything you're doing is to help someone else. I mean, obviously you're helping yourself at the same time, but you're giving back, you're helping so many things. And there's so much I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your, re your recovering and counseling center and talk a little bit about that and what that looks like. And, and you know, who are you helping there and, and uh, what your philosophy there is as well. Uh, maybe to, to just back up a little bit from there, um, because the, the treatment center is inextricably linked to our, our faith community and okay. recovery ministry there. Um, gotcha. when, when I was uh, ordained and staffed at the evangelical church, I, as, soon as, as soon as I was staffed and was starting to take a paycheck, I, I made a promise with myself that I would work within their statement of faith, even though I was pushing a, a good ways past it, right? Um, but I needed to to make sure that I was being, you know, working with integrity with them. But even so, as I started teaching, I it was opening up rifts within the church, and I realized there was nothing I could do to uh, to keep that from happening. Sure. As I was trying to be true to what I was understanding about my walk and my understanding of Jesus and the Gospels, so I resigned that 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 that. Uh, uh, job at some point and um, there was a group of people that wanted to start a church right off the bat and I didn't know why I would be doing that it didn't make any sense to me uh, other than just having a, a church that was under my control right so I resisted that for about three years um, before that I had been introduced to recovery and I fell in love with people at the the meetings. Again, it was music that brought me there. It was someone who invited right. me to be part of a, a musical group that was playing for a recovery gathering. And I didn't realize it was recovery. I was just joining the group and trying to help out there. But as I realized, these people were the ones who were right at the precipice. Their lives had taken them to the point where change was actually possible. And I realized it was the experience I was looking for in the community church and really couldn't find. Um, because it was people who were primed and ready. And um, so I started working in that area, started learning about the 12 steps. I was commissioned to to teach the 12 steps from a New Testament point of view at that group. Right. And so it became obvious at a certain point that we were going to start this new um, faith community, but it wasn't going to be just based on the usual community church model. It was going to be a recovery ministry. Our reason for for existence would be to create a hub and a community for people who are trying to recover. And of course, early on, even though I didn't have a substance abuse background, I realized that we are all recovering from something. Yeah. Everybody has unfinished business in their life. And, and as long as it's not addressed, we will be papering it over with something. And if it's not substances, then it's going to be what we call process addictions, some mode of behavior that keeps us distracted and busy enough that we can continue to function. And, and not answer these deeper questions in life. And all of that is, is curable through the same process. And the 12 steps are a perfect map of that process, but ultimately it comes down to the contemplative spirituality that we've been discussing that will take us through. Okay. And so that community was called The Effect, and we started it 13 years ago. And it was a, uh, a recovery community that also worshiped together is the way that we looked at it. Okay. And so kind of taking the church model and turning it on its head. Um, <laughs> but as we moved forward, we realized we needed more help. It, it's kind of, if, if you're going to preach the gospel to a starving person, what do you need to do? Well, you need to feed them. 
and, and, and get that off the table so that they can focus on something else. For, for recovering addicts and alcoholics and also people that are in such emotional instability that they really can't deal with uh, the, some of these deeper concepts, we needed to get them to a place where they were stable enough to be able to work further. And so we opened Encompass Recovery, which is an outpatient okay. treatment center and we're working on trying to get addicts and alcoholics and people who are just having problems relationally or emotionally in life up to a place where then we could take them to the next levels if they were so willing and so that was the beginning of it and it was about uh, eight or nine years ago that we opened encompass and uh, of course okay. covid has taken everybody's uh, practices <laughs> to a different yeah. level and so we're, we're sure. working on how we're we've been re retooling for the last five months and moving to teletherapy and then uh, figuring out how we're going to proceed from here. But the two have worked kind of hand in glove uh, in that respect. Wow. Yeah, well, I, um, I got to be there with a friend of mine years ago, and it was uh, an amazing place. And again, it's amazing work that you're doing there. Um, I want to, man, there's so much I want to ask you here. Uh, I know you just wrote a book called Daring to Think Again. You know, tell us a little bit about this book and some of the principles and concepts that you, that one would find in there. Actually, Daring to Think Again is uh, the second book. It's a companion book to the first volume, which is called The Fifth Way. Oh, okay. Sorry. But, about um, um, but either one can be accessed, you know, first and they can, they're standalone at the same time. Okay. But the, the fifth way is, is a look at, I, I think, the, uh, the Western Journey to the Hebrew Heart of Jesus is the, is the subtitle. And the idea is, is that if we are going to approach uh, Jesus from an Eastern and Hebrew point of view, which he adamantly is, he's an Eastern uh, teacher, right. um, Eastern audience and an Eastern language, if, if we don't approach him from that point of view, from an Eastern point of view, then we're going to misconstrue uh, what he's trying to say and the teachings. Uh, the whole worldview. So there is a journey to the journey that needs to happen from a West, modern Westerner's point of view. Um, there is a stripping away and a, um, a, a willingness to let go of, of a Western worldview enough to be able to stand or, or sit at the feet of an Eastern Jesus. So fifth way is about that, what that journey looks like, you know, how we have to actually assess our own worldview as we try to approach a very alien one uh, from which to understand Jesus teaching and then what do Jesus teachings really say from an Aramaic that would be the language that Jesus uh, spoke okay. uh, the Aramaic point of view what daring to think again does is say all right there's a shape to this journey it always looks like a descent before the ascent there's always a, a yeah. giving away and a, and, a, and, a, and a purging out and emptying out before we can be filled with something new Mm -hmm. What is that going to look like if we take 12 basic, uh, either theological, doctrinal, or just, you know, cultural concepts that we have just sort of accepted as true and apply this shape to it? What right. Jesus is basically saying is, in, in that story of the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. that one. Yeah. Okay. To me, this is, this is just the, the, one of the fulcrums of the, of the Gospels. The rich young man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And, and Jesus, first he says, good master, what must I do? And he says, well, why do you call me good? There's only one good who's in heaven. Yeah. And Jesus realizes is that this young man who is, is wealthy and he's got good standing in, in his culture has been following the rules, you know, perfectly, following all the commandments. Jesus says, well, follow the commandments. I've been doing this since, since childhood. Right. And one of the gospels says he looks at him and loves him because he realizes how sincere this young man is, but he's just been following rules. He hasn't broken through. Jesus retort to him, why do you call me good? He's realizing that this young man is just looking for another rule to follow that will be the formula that will take him where he wants to go. Yeah. So he has, he still realizes there's something missing here. And Jesus says, okay, here's the thing that you lack. You need to sell everything that you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. Now, the young man walks away sad because he's not prepared to do that. And we will literalize, over-literalize this and just think it's about another rule for us to follow, which is not be greedy and not accumulate right. and, serve, and save, serve the poor. But that's not the essence of what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is you have to be willing to let go of everything that you're clinging to. 
everything that you have developed in your life that you think is tantamount to your survival, everything that you think is what is going to get you the things that you need in life, let go of it all so that you can actually stand and perceive the truth. It's basically another call to presence. It's the same thing that we've been talking about all along in contemplative spirituality. But, but that's it. That's the key. He's not ready to go there yet. But if we are ready to first identify those things to which we cling, and it can be our whole culture, our worldview, as well as the things that we have experienced in our own life, the things that have impressed themselves in, in us as ingrained patterns of thought and behavior, if we aren't willing to do the work that it takes to become aware enough, present enough to see them in operation in our lives, and then work to empty them out, we aren't going to be able to see this truth that Jesus says will ultimately lead us to complete freedom, which okay. is a freedom from the fear that drives those obsessive compulsive patterns in our lives. That's the process. And so daring to think again is, is challenging us to challenge everything, to question everything that we have in place in life and see if it holds up as we move it through this meat grinder process here of stripping away, descending, and coming out the other side. So the first part of the, of the book is about that process again, using rites of passage, which we don't have in our culture anymore, but a true rite of passage, which incorporates separation from everything that you are familiar with, a transition, which right. takes you through some type of process that, that is always painful and disorienting, and then reincorporates <laughs> you on the other side. You know, sure. so that process, and, then a step, and then applying that principle to these 12 concepts. And, and they're, they're, they're big concepts like, like love and trust and heaven and hell and law. So, so big concepts that we have definite ideas about culturally and doctrinally. And saying, how is another way to understand these as we apply the teachings of Jesus from this Aramaic Hebrew point of view? And what does that look like? But it's basically a training of the process. It's okay. not so much to give you new ideas about these issues, but it's training you in the process to come up with your own ideas about the issues in your life. Wow. You just opened my eyes up to that whole story. I, I, I was looking at it differently too. <laughs> and you uh, really, really opened, uh, opened that up for me. And that book sounds amazing. Um, what, uh, so th that's a companion to your first book, which is called The Fifth Way. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Right. That's okay. Right. But you can get either one as a standalone as well, correct? It's interesting. You know, I, at this point, I'd say um, that people probably, if they're interested in, in moving this direction, start with Daring to Think Again. Okay. It's a short book. It's, it's, a much, it's a much more, um, you know, just kind of easier. It's an easier read. There's a lot of stories in it. Um, the Fifth Way has a lot of stories in it as well, but it, can, it tends to get more technical right. in terms of really trying to understand Jesus' teaching and breaks them down. Okay. And so, uh, but daring to think again will will definitely get your feet in the water, and you can decide if you want to uh, continue on in, in that path. <laughs> but okay. yeah, daring to think again, I think would be a, a good entry good point. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, um, if you could uh, give our listeners right now a challenge um, that uh, that you would, you know, maybe some of the same challenges that you give the people you work with. Can you maybe share a challenge with us at this time? Absolutely. The challenge is the same challenge that Jesus gave the rich young man. I mean, it is the, the challenge to every single one of us. Um, when, when, when Jesus called anybody, you know, what, what he was basically calling them to do was to step away from their familiar life, the life that they knew. If, whether it's fishermen throwing down their nets whether it's a tax collector leaving all of the money on the table as he runs to follow Jesus, the, the motif is the same and, and the metaphor is the same. Yeah. Are you willing to really take a look at the content of your life? Take a look at those five points, community, accountability, structure, discipline, and service, and see what it is that comprises your life. And if you still have a sense that something is missing, I mean, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But if you have a sense that something is missing, that there is more than you currently have and joy and, and, and can ascertain is, is the fullness of your own meaning and purpose and sense of identity, are you willing to do the work that it will take to let go of everything that you think you know, everything that you cling to for support, 
and embark on finding truth where it exists and not just where you expect it to be. That's going to be the key. And, you know, that, that sounds huge, but you can, you can make it really simple. You know, it, it's just, are you willing to start questioning everything in your life and seeing whether it's true or not? And that might yeah. sound scary, especially from a, from a doctrinal or religious point of view. But the truth of the matter is, is that in this process, we will never lose anything of significance or importance. And in my life, I had, I said earlier, I had to be willing to let go of even Jesus in order to find him. But in the process, everything came back that was of value. So even the things I was willing to let go of, the ones that were of value that have come back, nothing, nothing is lost. It's a, it's a, it's a scary journey in the sense that it feels risky, but in truth, there's really no risk involved. Yeah. Um, but that willingness to say, okay, I am going to take this step to question what it is I think I believe and find out whether it's actually true or it's just what I believe for whatever reason, because it was taught to me at an early age and right. I never really questioned it and I inherited it or, or for whatever reason, because I was fearful at the time and I grabbed onto this to cling to support. Are you willing to question those things and move into a deeper space? And even if that isn't so much the first step, as it is just saying, you know what, I just need to establish some more quiet in my life. Yeah. My life has gotten so noisy. Are you willing to turn off the news? Are you willing to get off social media just for periods of time where you can really get down to just some silence, which will illuminate the parts of your life that are lacking? Um, something as simple as that can be a starting point, but it has to be a clear desire and intention to live more simply and quietly. Wow, that's an awesome challenge, Dave. Thank you for sharing that with us. If our listeners want to reach out to you, Dave, and get get to know you a little better or have a question for you, or, you know, obviously, you know, maybe even to where they can find your books, can you give us some, uh, just some ways we can get a hold of you and contact you and your website? Sure, sure. There's, there's, there's two main points of contact. Uh, the Effect website is a great place to start. There, there's lots of resources and there's, there's book suggestions, articles, um, there's uh, the archive of past messages, all sorts of things are up there. And that's at theeffect.org. And okay. it's just like it sounds, T-H-E-E-F-F-E-C-T.org, theeffect.org. And then my personal website, davebrisbane.com, is another way that you can um, connect um, my phone number is, is published there. If you wanted to call me and talk to me about any issues, I'm, awesome. that's, that's, you know, well, that's why I'm here. Um, some people say, Oh, you're so busy. I don't want to call. And the fact is, is that everything else I do is so I can have a call like this <laughs> yeah. to, to right. talk one-on-one -on -one like I am with you, Todd is the best thing that I do. Uh, yeah. all long. And so, um, you know, this is my passion area and to get someone else, you know, passionate about, Finding these deeper parts in life is, is why I do what I do. So, uh, yeah, those two websites okay, <clears throat> great. would be a great place to start. Obviously, the books are available on Amazon if uh, that were an entry point as well. Wonderful. Well, Dave, I want to thank you so much for taking the time this morning. I, you're up bright and early, and I, you know, you're dedicating your time this morning for us. And you know, I can tell you that uh, I've been inspired today, and I know our listeners will be as well. And I want to thank you for just being the person you are. You're a great example. You know, as I, as I sit and listen to you, I realize, you know, I want to be better. I want to work harder in being more present and being more silent. I know that's where I need to work on. And, uh, but I love what you said. And I know there's so much more that we could talk about, but uh, we're going to wrap it up. And, uh, but I can't thank you enough, Dave, for just taking the time and sharing your, you know, a portion of your wonderful life with us today. Well, thank you, Todd. And, and exactly back to you. I mean, what you're doing here with your, with your podcast and the work that I know you're doing uh, is, is equally in the same vein, just trying to help people find a better way to live their lives and connect. Yeah. yeah. Connect, connect. That's so important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dave. And uh, there you go, listeners. Uh, another amazing guest, Dave Brisbane. Please reach out to him. I know that he'd be willing and, and would love to hear from you. And, uh, please, uh, you know, check out his books too. I, I just, uh, I gotta be honest with you. I just ordered your book, Dave, uh, dare to, to think again, right as we were talking, I, 
I placed the order on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you. Another yes. sale. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can retire now. You're good to go. Um, but yeah, no, I'm excited for that. And uh, listeners, please share this with people that you know that might be struggling, whether they're trying to find their place in the world or if they're struggling spiritually or if they're just struggling to try to find connection in their life. This, this podcast would definitely help them. Uh, in that direction. And so thank you for all your support. Thank you for believing in me. And, um, and again, thanks to our sponsor, Veracity Networks. Until next time.